Joining us on the How Did You podcast today is Call of Duty commentator Miles Ross, who is originally not only a gamer but also a streamer. Miles, what did you want to be when you were younger? That's a really, really good question, Taylor. Um, I think at one point I wanted to be, might have wanted to be an astronaut because let's face it, space is amazing. Um, I definitely wanted to be a comedian for a long time. And I, the, the, the best memory I have of seeing something that inspired me to go learn something and try to become it was I wanted to be a ventriloquist, which is very unique. I know I don't hear many people say that these days, but I remember seeing there was a show um, called The Big Big Talent Show years and years ago in the UK, I mean, decades, um, and my uncle hosted it. And I remember there was a ventriloquist who he had a puppet called Sam, and he was so funny. And as a kid, I just thought it was amazing that you could that could be you could have this thing in your hand that um, could be sort of such a conduit for laughter and joy. And I was like, I want to do that. And we, I bought like a, um, or I was gifted rather by mum and dad, like a build your own dummy thing. And it was like made out of paper. And yeah, it was great fun. I had a real laugh with it. Other than that, did you ever see yourself becoming a commentator? God, no, not for a second. It never crossed my mind once. It was never something that I aspired to. Um, when I first started gaming and I was sort of made aware of MLG as we all were, um, I remember watching Chris Bucket, Sonasi Giovanni, you know, or sometimes Shockwave Gandhi, like the guys in the old Halo circuit, watching them work and just, I loved it so dearly, but I wanted to be a player. I never, in my wildest dreams, thought that's the thing I would like to do. And it was never a, a, a even, not a possibility, but it was never even a thought of mine until sort of 2009, 2010, when someone did throw the mic in my hand and go, go on, mate, up you go, it's your turn. And that was pretty much it, but never, ever in my wildest years did I ever imagine commentary being the thing I wanted to do or would do. How was the journey from, say, London to Australia to now Los Angeles, where you're based? Ridiculous. Um, full of pitfalls and perils and stress and challenge, but ultimately very uh, rewarding ultimately. So I was born in the UK. I lived there for most of my life until I was about, you know, until I was about 10 actually. And then dad, we moved out to the US. We moved out to Santa Monica, not too far from where I am now, which is surreal. Dad works for DreamWorks. Um, and he went out to the US with um, a British comedian called Lee Evans, who a lot of the Americans are never familiar with, but he, they, he, they were business partners. They went to the US, tried to break America. We're there for about three years. And we came back to the UK. Um, Lived in the UK for, for for most of that time, went to school, finished, you know, you know, everything up until uni. After my university life, I met my now wife, um, Paul, who she's Australian. And she said, do you want to come back to Sydney? And that was that. So that was about 2010. And that was when I packed up absolutely everything. Not a single, you know, very, very few belongings, no consoles, no gaming, no nothing. It was like a backpack, suitcase, my guitar. And that was it. I was moving life. Closed my bank accounts, cancelled gym membership, which wasn't getting used much at the time anyway. And um, yeah, just made the, sort of the, the jump and flying out to Australia and living there was a really incredible, incredible experience. It's a beautiful place. The people there are wonderful. Her family are amazing. Um, and it was it was really great, but it was a hard pause on everything I've been doing up until that point, which was mostly gaming and um, working in TV in, in London. So that was all died then and there when I moved out to Sydney. And it was 100% a fresh start in life, um, which was very, very surreal. And to, to find myself sort of coming full circle, um, back into gaming is even more bizarre because not many people get the opportunity to come back into an industry like this after they leave. Um, but there were a few very strong voices who kept pulling me back. Um, Glenn Elliott from EGL, who's the man who gave me my first commentary gig. Um, before I was commentating, I was competing at his tournaments as well. And he was one of those guys that was like, mate, if you ever want to come back and jump back on the mic and have some fun, go for it. Um, which was really sweet of him. And he was really the reason why I became a commentator in the first place. It was sort of, I think it was when the Master Chief Collection first came out, which I think was 2015 or 14, could be now. He said to me, out of completely nowhere, I'd been fully detached from the gaming world. He sent me an email just saying, hi, Miles, hope you're well. I know you're in Australia right now. Do you have a suit? Can you come to London? I'd love for you to commentate this new game I've got my hands on. And I, I was like, what? There are more people far better suited to that now. I mean, I know there are a lot of folks working in the space regularly. This is around the time that like Halo 4 was out. And there was like, I know Richard Sims was going, going strong and going hard on the paint and um, Wonderboy, Harry Chan, and they were both like working their asses off. Gaskin was there as well. And I just remember thinking to myself, surely this isn't it for me. But when he was like, come on, mate, he really twisted my arm and he was like, you have to come down and do this. I was like, sure. So 
he paid for my flights and told me what was going on. And I was like, okay, cool. It's the a master chief collection. And that's that. And you're going to be working alongside strong side, who was one of my, you know, absolute gaming heroes, man, strong side and final boss. Those were the days. And, and we wound up having a really good tournament. It wasn't the best cast I've ever done, obviously after five years out of action. Um, but it was really fun and it was a really cool experience. And I had a great laugh and I just did what I knew at the time, which was try to be funny. In Australia, I was, you know, I was doing stand up in comedy clubs and or mostly bars. And I was learning how to become an improv comedian as well. And these were the things that um, ultimately, when I look back, gave me the, uh, the chops to sort of be able to perform in front of camera and be funny and engaging and all that stuff, even if I didn't necessarily know everything that was going on in game. Because at the end of the day, it's ultimately, this is an entertainment form. You know, no one's sitting here you know, this isn't an instructional YouTube video. We're trying to teach folks how to play the game. So that was pretty much what it what it came down to. And after that, the phone just kept ringing and went back to Australia. And before I knew it, I was part of multiple, you know, esports. I was covering, you know, Halo. I was covering some Call of Duty, Gears of War at times. I did a tiny bit of Rainbow Six. I did FIFA, Overwatch for a while. What else, God? There was loads of them. It was nonstop. And as I say, I was blessed to be in the position I was going back to Australia from that, where I met the guys from ESO Australia, um, Josh, Brad, Damon, Nick, amazing people. And basically they were like, let's get you across everything because we'd love to work with you. And we had a blast. We really, really did. It was, it was mad. Yeah. You speak about your time in Australia and how you were presenting different TV shows. How was it with screenplay? Screenplay was absolutely breathtaking, mate. It was a really amazing, um, amazing experience. So a uh, bit of context there. Screenplay was a TV show um, I presented alongside um, Nick Richardson, Nick Boy, and Stephanie Hexman Dixon, who are absolute legends in the Australian gaming world, like true legends. They came from um, a huge show out there called Good Game, which I knew nothing about as a bloody tourist. I feel like I spend my life wandering around, especially in this industry, blissfully ignorant about all the amazing people I'm surrounded by and their incredible histories, and they're just boundless talent. And I'm just sort of like, oh, hello, Mars. And they're like, hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. And people are like, do you know who that is? I'm like, no, they're just lovely to me. Um, but they are phenomenal human beings um, and they're still going strong now. The screenplay was, I suppose it was a weird dream because at this time, at the time I joined the, the, the crew there, I'd already been commentating esports for a few years and I was starting to get quite good. And um, I, was, I was sort of now a semi full-time staple on the COD World League circuit. This was during the World War II season. I'd done champs. I started in the Call of Duty team 2016, at COD XP, the champs was my real first event. Um, but I started during the Black Ops 3 season. And after that, Infinite Warfare, um, and I only really worked champs at that event. It was it was very difficult for me to get across the US. Um, and then the last event in the US I did was, uh, oh, sorry, the start of the, the the next season was World War II event. So I, I was at every single one, which was incredible for me because I was like, wow, I'm in the I'm in the gang now. I'm working for MLG. And that time I joined Screenplay as well. So this actually allowed me to quit my day job at the time, which was um, I was in corporate IT for uh, a, a massive massive insurance company out in Australia. And it was an incredible experience. I, I loved it. It was really amazing. It enabled me to basically moonlight as a commentator because it helped pay the bills. And I learned so much about myself. I learned so much about, you know, a totally different industry. And I met some really, really amazing people and friends for life. But I couldn't keep doing all of them. And when the TV show was like, we're going to need you in studio or and in, in the offices for like sort of three, four days a week, I was like, well, I have to quit my job now. And I didn't end up quitting the job. I took a sabbatical, took a, um, a career break, which was also amazing. But the TV show was a dream come true, really. I come from a massive TV family and the ability to finally get into TV, which is strange because as the IT guy in the family, I was the sort of like, you know, the outsider, the outcast in a weird way. They were like, what do you mean? You're not, you're not a production you know, assistant. You're not an editor. You're not a direct. You're not, what do you, what do you mean? You've, you've got a regular job that is nine to five and pays regular. I was like, I do. Yeah, it's really, it's mad. It's quite surreal. Yeah. You know, every day I go to work and every, you know, week I get paid. It was amazing. But um, screenplay was like, I was, I just couldn't, there was nothing that could have prepared me for that kind of exciting, creative environment. I was surrounded by really funny, wonderful people who wanted to just put on a cool show about gaming. It was, it was basically like a magazine show about um, video games. We did sort of live reviews. We did a lot of streaming stuff. It was all on YouTube and mostly towards the end. And we had a, a slot on TV. I think it was like Thursday or Friday nights. And it wasn't the best slot, but it was very, very exciting. And to be able to say to my mum and dad, like, I'm on TV. I'm, I'm a host on this really cool show. And when I look back, the memories are nothing but positive. We had some phenomenal times laughing our asses off constantly at work. And that was the dream. I remember my dad saying something very similar to me. He was like, the dream is when you realize that your job is to go to work, try to make each other laugh, 
and then come up with more ideas to make each other laugh. And that was when I really knew that we've done it, made it. It's all good. You mentioned gaming and you've been a fan of it for probably your entire life. Pretty much. Your gamer tag was The Wrath. How did that come around? So my full gamer tag was actually Heaven's Wrath, right? Oh. And I, pro I should probably preface this with, it was, uh, it was H, the number three, A, big V, E, N, S, capital W, R, A, seven, H. So picture that, you know, monstrosity in your head. Um, and at the time, that was quite cool because it's sort of like, it bobbed and flowed together. A lot of folks had like OO or XX or kind of things either side of their names, um, which is what we did back in the day. Um, the reason why I had a three and a seven in there, fun story, here comes, here comes the explainer. So three and seven is, it, it makes 10, right? 10 is the Japanese word for heaven. Um, and my original tag, my very, very first game, or online game name I had to grab, um, I played Warcraft 3 and I needed to create a, a handle there, a battle net handle, and I called myself Heaven Punishment. And Heaven's Punishment was taken directly from a Tenshu game, which was an old PlayStation game where you played as a ninja. And there was Tenshu Stealth Assassins and there was Tenshu, I think it was called The Wrath of Heaven. And, or Heaven's, I forget it now. I think it was The Wrath of Heaven. And I went with Heaven's Punishment, I think at the time, because that was the coolest I was like, so I was into my sort of like, you know, stories and mythology. And I was like, bit of biblical names kind of cool. This is fun. Um, and when it came to getting an Xbox and eventually getting on Halo 2, I changed it and pulled it right down to Wrath because Punishment simply wasn't going to fit. And then I got creative and carried away. And I was like, this is full circle again, like just coming back to the things I love and the stuff I'm interested in. So that is my full name. I dropped the heavens when I got sponsored by Dignitas. And I was like, all right, I'm a pro now. I've got to tidy this all up. Um, so that was when it became Dignitas Wrath. But to this day, Heaven's Wrath was my very first ever tag. I've got a shirt. I've actually got the jersey here. Hang on. Fantastic. Still got it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Good old, the good folks at Dignitas still talk to some of them. OD's still in the scene. But yeah, great fun. Really great fun. Sorry for the listeners there, obviously. I'm holding up a, a jersey with my name on it. But um, yeah, that was that was where the name came about from. And ultimately, uh, I dropped my gamer tag when I became um, a commentator very, very early on because I didn't want... I wanted at the same time to try to break in the TV. This was prior to getting on the screenplay. And I, my wife was the driver there. She was really like, Miles, look, no one's going to... No one, when you get into the sort of TV world, no one's really going to give a rat's who Wrath was ever with your handful of you know accolades that no one can watch anymore because all that stuff was played before we streamed live um so yeah i was it was a, it was i think it was a smart move for me to drop the tag and and invest full time in you know my name and therefore the brand whilst also investing in your name you became the play-by-play -play caster of the year how did that thank feel? you that was surreal mate that really really was um it's really hard to put into words what it feels like to be, I suppose, held in high regard in your industry because we all suffer from imposter syndrome in one way, shape, or another. We're all human. But in that moment of not just the winning of the award, but also of the um, being nominated and seeing my name alongside some absolute titans in the industry, people I really look up to all across the board. I mean, Machine Pansy, Artosis, like, Captain Flower, it's non-stop, Intero, non-stop across that whole, I mean, I could honestly read all their names out. Real pillars of the industry who have either been here forever um, or are just, you know, legends. To see my name alongside them was really humbling and really surreal. And it kind of just sort of, you have to, eventually you have to stop with the imposter syndrome and be like, you're here now, live up to it and do a good job. Um, and then to win it is entirely... Uh, in a whole different beast in itself and i'm immensely grateful for everyone who voted I'm immensely grateful for the sports awards the panel and everyone who believed that i was deserving of it and at the same time i know everyone sort of says like our oh, awards don't mean anything it's sort of it's like a strange it's either a strange popularity contest or it's fitting a certain niche or whatever but i'm still like i don't care it is an incredible honor to be nominated and it's even more of a of an incredible honor and a privilege to be to be the recipient of the awards so i'm very very grateful but mate I, it's impossible to put into words it really is it's very, very surreal to sort of wake up and be like, wow, cool, I had a good year. And now I've got this totem, this sort of like metal totem 
proving it almost. Um, and the, and the, the comments and the conversations I had that night and I have been having with folks from all across my industry has been absolutely surreal. And it's been a wonderful way to actually meet so many new people. I've not met, you know, I got to spend a bit of time with Captain Flowers who won it last year, the 2020 winner. And he was an incredibly lovely guy. He was so genuine. He was just overly enthusiastic about like how congratulatory he was. And I was like, God bless you, man. Um, I spoke to Uber as well, Mitch, who, you know, I'm a massive fan of. I think Uber is a brilliant commentator and a really lovely bloke. And, you know, I, I hope he bloody wins it one day because he's been there enough. Um, but yeah, mate, it was, it's, it's, it's surreal and, and wonderful. And yeah, hope to do it again next year. I've got a few texts from some very good mates who are like, I'm coming for it next year. And I was like, yes, let's go. This is very good friendly competition, but yeah, can't wait. You've spoken about how many years you've been in the industry. You've spoken about how you've come from London to Los Angeles, all over the country. But recently you were forced back home because of the pandemic. What was it like casting the Call of Duty League? from home was it a completely different experience we briefly chatted before this at how it's literally on camera what was it like <laughs> it was mad mate. i mean this room this room was where it all took place this used to be all be a gigantic green screen my entire second bedroom my wife and i have um it was utterly a studio and it still is you know with camera equipment we've got sound equipment we've got everything here it's all in here the lighting it was very very difficult initially to wrap our heads around the fact that we were doing this online again for a few of us it was uh, something quite familiar because a lot of us had cast from home anyway like we'd all i ran the entire you know anz um circuit for world war ii out of my study in sydney so i'm familiar enough with the way it works you know running your own broadcast from home is you know not a massive issue and something that we're all kind of used to but at the same time bringing the same level of intensity and showmanship and professionalism to a broadcast at times i think was quite difficult but as chance and i said to each other at the start of the year we were convinced that you know this is fine and this might be like it might be like this for a few years we don't know you know with the ever-changing nature of the virus so we thought to ourselves we're going to go in with absolute 110 percent every single day no matter what and i've i've held this sort of my sort of mantra my my axiom every day waking up was this is a very strange and difficult time. I'm blessed to have a job during all this, let alone a weird job like this. But also out of sheer respect for everyone on the team who rocks up, puts everything they've got into making the show happen, to all the fans who tune in to want to know what's going on and watch their favorite teams, to everyone. Showing the, the respect to their energy and their efforts was paramount for me. So I had to bring my A game because everyone else was and everyone was so invested and so committed. And that's the same with every show, I suppose I do, but particularly from home, I just wanted to make people feel like there was something very, very normal about this and watching games as if, you know, we're in an arena. And that's why I wanted to, you know, do as much as I possibly could. Yeah, I had some fun gimmicks on the way, messing around with GoXLR, applying like weird voice filters, using the beat button and all that stuff. Had a ton of fun with it. We tried to innovate because, you know, we're at home. Everyone knows we're at home. So I brought my dog on the show, you know, with anything like that. You know, sometimes you hear him barking. Same with, you know, Merck and Maven's dogs barking in the background and Lando's dog. It was wonderful. You know, it was, there was no point in shying away from the fact that we were all in this situation, but we were in it together. Whether it was the fact that, you know, I'm showing you that I'm wearing pajamas instead of, you know, or, you know, a, a suit jacket or whatever. I, I, it, we just wanted to lean in and not be fake about it. And in that, I think in that bred this distinct sense of, you know, have fun. Don't forget that this is for fun. And if we can take, if we can make someone's day that little bit better in these sort of like five, six hour broadcasts with in, in any way, let's do it. So that was always the way, mate. That was the, that was the driving force. And then it was the ultimate payoff in the world, getting it to go back to champs and be on land and have a show in front of people. And the amount of folks that came up to me and said, hey man, thank you so much. You guys really made the biggest difference for me during COVID, which was a difficult and depressing time for a lot of folks. But I really looked forward to watching the COD League every other week. And I was just like, oh God. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. You know, that that was why we did it. And, you know, it was it was worth every single complaint from my wonderful neighbors who didn't really complain, but they heard almost all of it. Um, it was worth it all. Let's tip that all on its head. What was it like to then go to Champs? Champs was terrifying, to be completely honest. When the idea that we were going to get reunited with the crew was, you know, the the dream it was so fun. We had an amazing time. You know, getting weird things like getting my co-casters and crew to meet my dog for the first time, all sorts of things that were wonderful. But it was it was incredibly nerve-wracking. The very first time we walked into the arena at the Galen Center, the very, very first time I saw that stage, because 
Lottie couldn't make it. So I was hosting and I was like, oh, cool, this is where I'm working. And I wouldn't know the, the second I saw the stage, and I mean this so sincerely, I got massive nerves that I was immediately hit by this wave of nervousness. And I was like, I've not felt that in quite some time. And that's a very, very good thing, obviously, you mean to be nervous is to care. And believe me, folks, we care. But it was shocking initially, you know, and just to see the amount of folks involved, I forgot how big the crew was. We saw so many people that day. And then, you know, the energy in the room was electric. I know it was difficult to sort of translate to through the stream. But for those people who are in the venue, you'll never forget that kind of event. It was the first one back in 300 and something days, too many days, over a year. And it was absolutely breathtaking. It was a strong reminder of why we do this, why we put on these shows, the energy, the fandom, the, the passion um, is unmatched. And Call of Duty is really special for that. And I can't wait to do it again this season. I really, really cannot because everywhere we go, obviously the plans are all different. Initially, we were going to travel to every single franchise city. Um, and looking back to like CDL London, the energy, the passion there, if we'd made it to Toronto, no doubt it'd be the same. Paris would have been electric. All across the US has been fantastic, you know, and we're hoping to do it all again. And we really can't wait to get this show going. But maybe the energy and the fun and just the enjoyment and everything that happens in between is, it is utterly breathtaking. Fantastic. How excited are you for this year's season? I'm really excited. It's, it's difficult. You know, this has been a weird off season. It feels like 20 minutes, maybe three weeks at most. Um, we're really excited for, for what's coming. Um, I don't know what's coming totally yet. I've seen some plans and I know it's good and I've heard some murmurs. Um, I'm really excited. I like Vanguard a lot. I think obviously it needs a lot of work um, in the state it's in right now, which is cool because we know Sledge are working on it. We've already got the bomb glitch fixed and I know there's tons of other things they're working on, which is really cool. And I'm just excited to see what happens. I know we've got rank play on its way as well, which is really good. And that's coming sooner rather than later, which is also brilliant because I mean, it's, it's a very, very important facet of a game. And I think everyone knows that now. And I think if anything, I'm looking at Halo's newfound success again, which I'm super happy about. It's really nice to have a ranked mode in a game that just lets you play against players who are also going as hard as you are. And as competitive gamers, that's all we want. Um, so yeah, it's been amazing, man. And I can't wait to see what's going on there. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the Vanguard season has cooked up for us. I love the teams. I'm really excited to see what some of them do. I'm excited about the storylines, this whole Optic Dallas merger, which we thought was going to be really weird and strange, but now we have Texas. Um, and we're sort of moving away from these cities and moving more into these like states in a weird way, because Minnesota, uh, Minnesota, Florida, and now Texas in terms of states within the teams. But yeah, can't wait. Between drama, storylines, good gameplay. And it's going to be a mad game as well. I mean, for those who've watched any of these tournaments, time to kill's fast. The maps are a bit mad. It is going to be a year where clips will reign supreme. So keep an eye on Twitter, keep an eye on Reddit. It's going to be mad. Can't wait. You speak about clips. What was your reaction to Skunk win 100 grand? I was there on stage at the World Series Warzone, and I swear to God. So we joked about it at the start of the World Series Warzone show, where in the prelude, I was like, Skump, how are you feeling about it? And he was like, ah, oh, my bar is so low. I don't know what's going to happen. I've not played this game much, you know? And I was like, well, it's good that your bar is so low. It's good that your expectations are way down there. Because imagine what the newspapers will read when you win it. And oh my God, mate, when we... So Ali Cat on show, behind the scenes, this is while Merck and Maven were casting, she was like, she brought up Skump's stream on her iPad. And she was watching all of it. And she was like, he's in a bush. He's in the final 10. And she was sort of commentating the match as it went along. And she called him to win the whole thing, no matter what. She was like, I think Scump's got it. He's the king for a reason. And we were all kind of joking like, oh, yeah, yeah. Everyone always picks Scump for something. Yeah, yeah. But when he actually did it and the journey he took to get there, everyone else in the game was running, what, stuns and bright shields. Scump just ran his EM2 and a Diamati, which ripped his way through some unbelievable players. And it was a historic moment in Call of Duty for me because there's been this never-ending discussion between pro players and content creators and warzone streamers who's the best and to see scum kill his way through some of the most well decorated and successful warzone players huskers my is in there at the end i forget who the who the fourth or fifth fifth kill was but and then to 1v1 aiden to win the whole thing it could not have been any more imaginable like brilliant i couldn't have imagined anything better i couldn't have written anything better i wish i could bloody write this i wish i could stage all this stuff because i would try to get a similar sort of situation when scum won i really did jump out my chair and scream yes as though we'd won like my team had won and that's nothing against the warzone guys i love them dearly like they're some of them are really really good friends and i wish them all continued success going in a cool era this season 
But at the same time, I'm a comp player. I have always been a comp player. I will always be a comp player. So to see Scumpy and that moment in time, he represented all of us in the CDL. He represented all of us who prefer, you know, 4v4 arena style gameplay to Battle Royales. To see him come out on top, it was so electrifying, man. It was perfect. If you had to choose maybe a present or a past kind of CDL player to then take the content creator route, who would it be? That's a really good question. I have always think, I mean, I always, I still believe, and I think it might still be the case, but I think Envoy could be really good for that. I know Hector was kind of grooming him to be the next scum. Everyone was calling him the prince to his king. And I don't doubt it. He's a really good bloke. He's got an amazing story. Um, he's got a really beautiful brain for the game. So I think he could create a lot of wonderful content in game, which I think would be really interesting to see because we all like learning and that's part of content creation these days. It's one thing to watch like a 55 and 0 gameplay on YouTube, but for those of us who can learn something to apply to our own game or even learn something that we can apply to watching the Call of Duty League or even watching Warzone tournaments, that is massively beneficial. And I think he's a great player and an even greater teacher. So I think he'd still be a, a really good pick for me. But honestly, mate, there's so many of them out there and there's so much like potential um, and I just hope that they can, I hope those players, those who are willing to really put the hard work in can get in, can get, you know, into that. And I, I think what Octane's done in the last year, he's a really good example of somebody who's got the gift of the gab, you know, he kissed the Blarney stone, the boy can spin a phrase, but at the same time, still excellent at the game and potentially a really good ambassador for it in that regard. Um, as long as he stops getting fined all the time, but I don't think that will happen this season. I think it'll be a little bit different, but yeah, mate, there's a lot of potential out there and I hope they can find themselves in there because we need more scumps. We really, really do. Let's continue to talk about the Call of Duty League. Do you have a pre-show ritual? Yeah, Chance and I, um, so my pre-show ritual right now, especially working from home, I get a great big coffee from my local place and I get a breakfast burrito, which is probably not the healthiest way to start every single show day, but I don't care. Those are the things I do first and foremost. Shower, bit of a shave, tidy up the cheeks because, you know, got a I'm a hairy man. Um, and then uh, we sort of get in here and Chance and I sing to each other. We sing, um, oh, what's the exact name of the song? Let me just, I don't want to get this wrong, but Chance starts it off and his, um, that, this is his, uh, oh my God, what is it? <laughs> he starts it off. It's the, I've, I've already forgotten what it's called. The Banana Boat song? Yeah, the Banana Boat song by Harry Belafonte. That's it. He starts it off, he goes, Dale! and then I sing back to him. And that's our sort of pre-match thing. But to be honest, and a lot of people ask me about this, how do I prepare for matches? So that's the sort of silly things we do just before the game to get things going and get our voices up there. And I do a lot of vocal exercises. I, I, this year I got, um, with the notion that I'm using my voice constantly, I've started taking singing lessons and predominantly not so I can sing because I would love to be able to sing more so. And I'd ask my, my teacher, was like, who do you want to, what do you want to do? And I was like, I'm more than anything, I want to know how to take better care of my voice. I want to know how to warm up my voice properly and potentially warm down my voice and any things in my day-to-day -day life that are impacting my voice's, you know, strength or whatever. I'd like to be made aware of that. And then she was like, yeah, but we've got to learn a song. I was like, all right, go on, let's do, uh, let's do some, some Queen. I want to sing like Freddie Mercury. And let me tell you, friends, Freddie's a beast. We don't call him the absolute front man of all time for a reason he's unbelievably difficult to do but that that stuff aside i do warm up properly we do sort of get things going properly but as far as match prep goes chance is all numbers and i've joked about this in the past but while he's pouring over spreadsheets and match histories and things like that and we do talk about that i my actual approach to coming into a match is to not look at call of duty as much as possible if at all i really do love coming into a game as fresh as i can so I used to joke with Chance that I'd watch Star Wars, you know, I'd put on, I'd put on a new hope and just let it roll in the background as a way to sort of like wipe my mind clean of the game. So that when I do get into that game for the first time, I'm extremely receptive to everything that's in match. And that is kind of a joke, but it is also very true. The best way for me to prepare for a massive game is actually to not think about the game at all. I'm one of those people, I, 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 I have certain lines or certain phrases, sometimes certain finishing phrases, you know, like big closeouts to a match that I'll have prepared. But honestly, 75% of the time, it is as far away from the game as it possibly can be. Oh. If you had to choose two players that would take on Champions Hill and win the whole thing, or choose four players that would just win champs this year, who would it be? Oh my God. I think four players I would like to see win champs this year. Uh, it's honestly the Toronto Ultra Boys. I am clearly biased, but 
I just think they've had an amazing run of the last sort of now, I suppose, since the CDL kicked off. Um, they worked so hard, they've faced such adversity, and no one has taken and, and I said this at Champs as well. And I remember talking to Paul, who's the owner of Atlanta Phase, and he was like, I'm I'm so glad you picked Phase to, uh, sorry, I'm so glad you picked Ultra to win the whole thing because I believed in everything you said. At Major 5 in the Cold War season, Toronto were reverse swept five maps in a row. This has never happened in Call of Duty history. It may never happen ever again. Um, and the Rocker resurgence or the Rocker revenge, whatever you want to call it, the resurrection. Minnesota Rocker embarrassed them beyond belief. And I can't imagine the absolute pain and sorrow and abject misery that those boys felt that day because they were up five maps to nothing and then they lost sorry, four maps to nothing, and then they lost five in a row to lose the tournament. And this would have been their second major win in the year, which would have been great for them and would have set them up really good for going into champs against FaZe, they're unquestionable, their rivals. But they lost it, and I will never forget their faces on that stage. I will never forget the tweets that they sort of sent out afterwards, ever. And I thought to myself, they're going to come back stronger than they could have ever come back before. Everyone said they were done, the year's finished, they're over, they're rubbish. And I was like, no, they've never, no one's faced a loss like that before. And they are going to bounce back from this. And we should all be very afraid of Toronto Ultra because there's something about playing when there's something to prove. Um, we've all seen the last dance. We've all seen Michael Jordan talk about how it gets personal. Things get personal. Well, let me tell you, mates, I reckon if you are a member of that Toronto Ultra team and you received thousands and thousands of tweets, messages, posts on the internet, comments on Instagram, you name it, saying you're this, you're that, you're rubbish, you don't deserve this one, you should all retire, that team should be scrapped, whatever. Nothing in the world could fill you full of more power than that. And to see those guys go to the bitter end against an incredible team like Atlanta Faze was really wonderful for me. So I think to see them win it this year would be, it'd be, it'd be really special after everything they've gone through, truly. Who is your rookie of the year? Oh, it's insane, without a doubt. And yeah, I am biased, but I also, and I will back this up because a lot of folks said it should have been Hydra. A lot of folks said it should have been Standy. And they're br brilliant players in the run right. But for me, Insight joined that team and they immediately won the major. He broke the Search and Destroy kill record against Hunter of Thieves in his very first match. He turned heads without a shadow of a doubt. And he turned them from a very, very mediocre team to a brilliant team overnight. I think Jamie Craven, you know, obviously I'm biased as hell. Like he's a he's a good dude, and we've talked about this a fair amount. But at the end of the day, he turned that team into a into a winning team, into a championship team. Hydra and Standy, they got there eventually, but it was still very very mixed results. I think Hydra will be a force to be reckoned with for the rest of his career, without a shadow of a doubt. That New York team next season will be very dangerous. But for me, the immediate impact and the transformative impact that Insight had on his squad. You can't argue with. Yes, Minnesota did eventually win a major with Stanley, the most famous major of all time. But their success was so hit and miss. It was so up and down. Ultra were very, very consistent. Um, and to that, I credit Marky B, the choice of bringing on in insight, which I think actually might have been, um, is it Flex? I forget. I don't, I don't remember the exact story, but that, he, for me, he is the rookie of the year. He replaced Methods. Do you see Methods either becoming a substitute for a team or do you see him taking the con content creator role he can do whatever he wants frankly man methods is a really talented bloke and um, he's a good guy and he can honestly do anything he sets his mind to hell i wouldn't mind having him on the desk i think he'd be good on the desk i think we can put him on the mic at times i think he'd be a lot of fun there he's obviously very confident very charismatic he knows what he's talking about i'd love to see him do that i really really would but he can go to any team he wants to frankly and i hope he gets on a team i hope that whatever's happening with this next final slot in the league it is him I know he was devastated because I think there was rumors going around that he was going to be part of the Washington team that fell apart. That would have been phenomenal because he's still a really, really good player and he's bloody hilarious. Can I swear on this, by the way, Taylor? Can I let rip? Fuck yeah, man. He's great. I love him. Methods is a good bloke and he's still great at the game and he's got a long career ahead of him as far as I'm concerned. Speaking about careers, if you had to bring back a team from the past, uh, retired card goats, anything like that, who would it be? Ooh. I, I, miss, I miss watching Jerd play. I must admit, um, he was a really exciting player to watch. I miss watching formal play. I know I can watch formal play. He's streaming every day, but a lot of the players we lost this season, Karma, we lost in 2020, you know, didn't want to play Modern Warfare anymore. It's fair to him. He's still unbelievable. 
that first when I first joined the COD scene in, in 2016, halfway through the the Black Ops Three season, everyone I didn't know anything about COD, and everyone sort of got me up to speed as quickly as they possibly could. Shout out to the guys at ESL Australia, everyone on COD Reddit, like you're all amazing. That Optic Dynasty team I saw play were really, really something special because I know throughout IW they were untouchable. Um, but during that Black Ops 3 season, watching them play, it was really exciting because I knew that they were the true fan favorites and I knew that they weren't quite the best team, but they were good, but they definitely weren't the best team. And that was so exciting for me to root for them at that point in time. Obviously, watching them lose was also amazingly exciting as a kind of neutral. Um, but as far as like bringing an old team back, I don't know, man. I would just have to say that all the sort of champions who have retired this last two years, JCAP, you know, Apathy Slack. Well, no, Slack's still kicking. Apathy's gone. There's a lot of players out there I do wish stuck it out because I know the league is difficult for a lot of them. There's so much talent now that is getting harder and harder to compete. Yeah, I miss the old heads. I miss those old heads. What about Epsilon or Splice with the Swan Ejerd, Mad Cat, those kind of guys? Legends, man. Absolute legends. I know Mad Cat's still about. Swanee's vanished off the face of the planet again. I know he does that, um, which is cool. And if he ever wants to come back, there's a spot for him on the desk, I can assure you that. Um, he's a very, very good bloke. I miss Mad Cat a lot. He was one of the best European players in my mind. And whenever I saw him play, I was always blown away. And it was so easy to get behind him. Like, there's an absolute, he's, a, he's an absolute madman. He was one of the people who, when I first joined the scene, he was really, really nice to me. Um, and I'm, I respect that a lot, especially when you're a competitor. Last thing you want to do is like sort of try to be sort of nice to like the new bloke coming in who doesn't really know anything. But no, that was a good, but he's a really, really good guy. Much love. So I've reached out to a couple card pros and they had a few questions. Let's go. Let's have it. How can I grow a beard like you? Ask me. <laughs> <laughs> how can I grow make sure you add this how do you spell luscious <laughs> how do you spell luscious oh my god Stanley what a gem what a good egg well luscious so I mean the best advice I've got which I give everyone else is time um Shave it lots. It's just like your pubes. Remember the first time you shaved them, they came back with a vengeance. It's the same thing. It's just on your face. Give it lots of time. Um, folks who are like, oh, do I need oils and special? No, you just need to let it grow. Shave it. Let it grow. Shave it. And within time, you will get a full face of hair. And not everyone gets the full face of hair. Some folks I know get that cool like Keanu Reeves beard, a bit of space either side. And all that. Everyone's different. Everyone's got a different facial hair growth pattern uh, and the important thing is uh, it's just let it grow give it a big shave let it grow again give it a big shave let it grow again give it a big shave and eventually get a really good barber that's the ultimate secret yeah uh, ask him does he think sniper should be in from a yes. cash or standpoint yes. and from a cdl like a professional standpoint all yes we have to have snipers we have to all yes smokes are fine in this game and the snipers, the flinch is strong enough. And you die in two bullets anyway. You get murdered in this game. We have to have snipers. If you miss the shot, you're dead to every gun in the game. It's well worth it. If a good sniper hits the shot, awesome. I want it as a commentator. The fans want it as fans. The players want it as players. End of discussion. Snipers have got to be in this year. Good old Drazza. We've also got a few questions from the COD Competitive Reddit. and All lovely people, mostly. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> You never know. I I N I C would like to know: Would you ever leave Call of Duty competitive for Halo competitive? I will be fully honest. I tried. Uh, I wasn't having a good year during 2020. None of us were, um, and I tried to sneak out the back door when things were getting really rough. Uh, or maybe not sneak out, but I did lay the seed because I was excited as all the other Halo heads were about Infinite, and I spoke to the people, and it didn't quite work out based on scheduling and timing and whatnot. And I'm absolutely down with that, but ultimately, you know, I know COD is. COD is like my future and I know that the game is you know great and I love Chance and if not, actually not for Chance I might have tried to go further but he really held me down and kept me back and and sorry kept me back sounds rough he really he really gave me a great reason to stick it out and and see this year see the year through properly and then we've had a great time ever since but I love the HCS but I also feel like Halo will always have the greatest place in my heart and it is the game I grew up on. It is the game that I love with so much of my being. 
um i want them to have all the success in the world and i want those i want the talent there to have a good time and i was much so i would love to join them almost all of them are very my very very good friends we're in a very sneaky group chat together we have been for years now um i really hope they blow up i hope it goes so good for them all because i love them dearly really do the same person also asks how did you get so good at wordplay oh that's a weird one it's not really something you can get good at it's something that you just have to sort of notice um look actively look for and then try to apply it in the right situations i learned most of this from my family um everyone's sort of my, my dad's side of the family um cockney geezers from leighton stone from east london sort of speak in riddles anyway there's a lot of rhyming slang and you know both my mum and dad are one of six my mum's scottish side of the family both one of six nearly everyone is in tv in some way shape or form or in the entertainment industry in, in one way or another so everyone sort of has this kind of like bravado. Everyone's got a funny turn of phrase and everyone's great. And I basically picked up as much as I possibly could from all of them. And I suppose the same can be said for everything I do. I watched a really amazing interview with Christopher Lee, um, the bloke who plays Saruman in The Lord of the Rings. May he rest in peace. He says the most important thing you can possibly do in your career is learn everything. Um, so I try to, and I tell this to everyone who asks me similar questions, I draw influence from absolutely everything around me. And I mean, everything. If I hear somebody say something weird on the bus, I will try to remember it. I write down a lot. Weird books like this full of shit you'll never see. Um, I do try to learn from absolutely every medium. I love, you know, taking things from music. You know, I love street art, like political satire, anything, you name it. You know, my wife is really big on trying to go to like the theater and stuff like that. So I'm like, you know, let's go to the theater. Let's see what's up. We learn from that as well. So I, the best advice I have is that how do you get good at it? Be open to it. Put yourself in positions where you can absorb as much as you possibly can. And then use it sparingly. That is another thing. No one likes flowery show off who's just waffling all this stuff constantly. There's a time and a place. You know, you got to think of it like your special move, like your finisher in wrestling. You only do it when it's really worth it and the crowd's going to enjoy it. But that is another skill you have to learn. As well as asking a question, they say they truly appreciate your presence in the scene. That's very kind of them. Thank you so much for the questions. And um, here's to many, many more years of God. As well as that, we've also got one from XRTFTW. That's a mouthful. Reddit, user Reddit usernames are a pain in the ass, let's be honest, mate. They are. Um, they ask, who's got the second best beard in the scene? Oh, it's, uh, it's either Maven or Nameless, although Merck's getting a good beard these days. Um, there are no players with sort of proper beards, I think. It's got to be Nameless. I know he takes a lot of good care and love of his beard. And, and Clint's had a beard for a long time as well. God bless him. But, um, yeah, Merck's, Merck's creeping in there, man. Joey D's getting a nice bit of facial hair. But yeah, we'll see. I think he might have shaved. Through. I don't know. I'm faded. I'm faded. A question that you've kind of summed up but i'd be interested to know uh it says do you have another job outside of casting and streaming what about other three casters how did you get into casting in the first place as, as in terms of like my full-time job is it is a commentator for the league that encapsulates a lot of other responsibilities um but i am one of very few people on the planet that can say that this is my full-time profession and i am incredibly grateful for that every other almost every other commentator you see in every other game are freelancers it may or may not be their full-time profession, depending on how frequently they work. Taking the leap into freelance life is terrifying as well. Um, if anyone has ever worked in any kind of freelance position, you know how difficult this is. I never quite went full freelance um, before I joined the COD League because I simply had my day job the entire time. I would take my annual leave to fly to the US and do events occasionally, which, God bless my wife, she... she she supported me the whole way. And I was like, we're running out of holiday time, love. It's not like we can do anything great, you know? So that was a real blessing. Um, but I got into commentary. I was a player. That was my way in. But for anyone who is looking to get in, um, and again, the series of events, the little dots that lead to this moment, you know, when I look back, I'm like, well, it makes perfect sense. But you never know what those moments are. So for the, the best advice I can give people who do want to get into this space is be open to opportunity. Don't say no to things. Say yes to everything you can. And for those of you who are like, oh, I'm not getting any jobs or I want the experience, you have to create those opportunities for yourself. Esports is an amazing place where you make the job you want. There are so many stories of people who have created this, created like something cool, had it circulate across social media, realized that, that was cool and they like doing it, done it more and more and more. And before you know it, it's their job. 
Perfect example of that in the commentary scene, I hold shift. Alan is one of the hardest working people on the face of the planet. And everything he does is in service to being a commentator, becoming better at being a commentator. And that is amazing. Truly, truly amazing. Um, not everyone's journeys are the same. So my way in was pretty weird. My way back in was even weirder. But at the end of the day, say yes to opportunities. Commentate over YouTube streams if you have to. Record yourself and use that to promote yourself as well. This is There's no ladder. There's no guaranteed path. But I wish you the best of luck. And a lot of fun. It's good, some very good advice. Um, another question from EDD uh, is, how much of an influence does your uncle Jonathan Ross have on your career? Both his and your personality and broadcast style are so alike. I also find it funny how few people in the community know that you guys are related. We are related, yeah. Uncle Jonathan is a legend. Obviously, he's got a bloody OBE. I don't think I'm getting one of those in my lifetime, but we'll see. He has... It's difficult to not have... It's difficult for him not to have an influence on my style and whatnot but i never wanted to be i never wanted his job per se i mean i wanted to be a stand-up that was my sort of thing but it's impossible to not have influence because the whole family's like that you know my dad's entire family you know are all mad loud extroverts and i mean mad it's great fun christmas was amazing when we could do it in person um so it's not just him, it's my dad, it's, you know, my uncle Paul, who's a genius, it's my uncle Simon, who's also an incredible genius, my uncle Adam, who's a legend, you know, my aunt Lisa, who's just phenomenal. It's, it is, it is surreal, you know, they're all mad. So it's not just Jonathan, but he, he's obviously a big influence, he's the one, the big one on telly, but um, it all really comes from my grandma, who passed away in 2019, uh, just before the CWL season started. She was the sort of, the biggest and maddest of them all. She had so many stories, she had stories of show business and she was so great at like networking and everyone knew her. So she was the sort of like incredible influence on all of us. You know, she would walk through the town square where she lived in Hitchin. And I mean, everyone knew, oh Maureen, how you doing? How's things? Oh, we saw Jonathan's show, isn't that great? Yeah, and she had a story for everyone. She knew everyone's name and she really was this incredible force of nature. And I suppose, she is the greatest influence on all of us that we could have ever asked for. The grandma Ross really, she, she kicked more ass than anyone. And she's the real reason why, you know, when I enter a room, I try to learn everyone's name, try to make everyone laugh, try to make sure I was having a good time. That is it. So more than anything, it's my grandma. May she rest in peace. May she rest in peace indeed. Let's completely change it up. Um, Infectious Pineapple, who is an LA Thieves fan, according to the Reddit, wants to know what your favorite dinosaur is. Favorite dinosaur? Probably the Velociraptor. I think the Velociraptor is a fearsome um, predator. And when I look back at like their appearances in the Jurassic Park films, always probably the best scenes. In the first one, the whole kitchen scene. In the second one, when they're like in the tall grass bit, shit terrifying me as a kid, amazing, absolutely amazing. After that, it gets a bit messy. And then eventually Chris Pratt like made them his mates, which I suppose was whatever. But I, I'm a big fan of the raptor. I think it's a very, very cool dinosaur. All dinosaurs are pretty cool, to be honest. Amazing. And now the idea that they actually had feathers, mental. Amazing. What a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Completely random, but it is what it is. Another one that is briefly mentioned it recently in the podcast, but Sir John 1995, who is from Scotland, which is, I'm guessing, oh, about to this ask this question, sorry. Hi, Miles. I noticed that you have a black, uh, both an English and a Scottish flag on your Twitter and was wondering what your link to Scotland is. My mum's from Scotland. Um, Mama Ross, she was born in Edinburgh, but most of the family live in Glasgow. We spent a lot of time there as kids. Scotland is one of the most beautiful places on the face of the earth. and I will always love Scotland as long as I live. Um, and of course, my surname, Ross, which is confusing enough because it's my dad's surname, is a famous Scottish clan. You know, Ross is a it's a Gaelic word that means promontory or hill. And um, when I married my wife uh, in 2018, I wore my family's kilt, my, the Ross Tartan, which I don't have here, but mum and dad are bringing it. And I'm very excited to whip that out on broadcast soon. But yeah, that's, that's so I'm, I'm Scottish mum, English dad. And as far as I'm concerned, when people say, where are you from? I'm like, I think I'm from Britain because 
you know, I'm trying to sum up the whole line in there, but Scotland has a really special place in my heart, and I love it dearly. Her horse is six, another unusual name, but an Optic mm. Chicago fan would like to know Ooh. what your favourite Call of Duty to cast ever since you joined the CDL is, and why? I think my favourite one to cast might have been Cold War. Chance and I just had so much fun on that game. There was a lot going on, the maps were quite fun, the gameplay was, was a, a nice sort of blend of really skillful and speedy, and I really enjoyed watching it. But I think the one that has the most special place in my heart has to be Black Ops 3. First game I really got involved with. It changed my life forever. And it was lit. I, I don't care what anyone says, man. Specialists are really fun. But like the payload abilities, all that shit makes the game really exciting to watch. Black Ops 4 as well was really good. I just, I, BO3 for me, it got me into the scene. It introduced me to COD. I got to see the fans in action for the first time. I got to see how important this was to so many people. And it really, it got me the, that was the bug. That was the itch that really got me going. So it has to be BO3. Yeah, it really does. Toolkit from Philly asks the <laughs> most popular question of the thread. Ooh. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this, but I'm from trying. your point of view, it says, Miles, if you were in charge, what is the third game mode? Oh, here we go. I think... See, it's, I don't know if it's going to work in a World War II game, but Uplink was amazing. Like, the game mode was so fun to watch. It made perfect sense for new viewers. For existing viewers, you realized how skillful and strong like a team had to be to really win a game. Uplink was lit. I like Control. I think Control is really cool. Shout out to Treyarch for bringing that one in, of course, during BO4. CTF really depends on the maps. That could be amazing, or it could be another Ardennes Forest year, which pff, I don't want to do, frankly. I don't think the players want to do. I just, I think it's Uplink. I really, really do. Uplink was lit. And I mean, I don't think Gridiron worked in World War II, but <sighs> mate, Uplink, so fun. So fun. That United Envy, was it United Envy? Yeah, that comeback is still one of the greatest moments in Call of Duty history. Bar none. Unbelievable. Uplink. Yeah, definitely. When you think, when you say Uplink, there's the um, optic last match oh, of champs as well there you go that's that's crazy um yeah it's so it's an exciting game mode and it creates brilliant moments that we all love definitely jay vitti would also like to know what would it take you to shave that glorious beard you have oh uh i've thought about it a few times for charity or um i talked to the guys at movember who were really fun and they were they had some cool ideas and i was just like ultimately guys and i mean this very sincerely my wife would kill me i have had a beard now for many years and every single i've shaved it clean twice and every time i've done it she's just doesn't know who i am she can't recognize me and i'm like but i'm your husband she's like you're not you don't understand and uh, i know if, if there are any ladies listening and your man does have any kind of facial hair when that facial hair goes they are a different person so i fully sympathize gals and guys by the end of the day i don't think i can shave it also if i shave it i'm just another dude on the broadcast i'm no longer like the, the beardy guy you know so i feel like i have to keep it for my brand Given what it was like to get used to a new casting duo you were great for a few years with your previous partner but then you had to start forming new chemistry with chance which i think you guys did very well now you two are at the top with merc and maven which i was pleasantly surprised by honestly mate a really really good question it was not easy um to build that kind of professional chemistry with ian we are friends and we have been friends at my first event, COD XP, we cast together then. And I knew like, wow, this guy's great. This is really, he's making this really easy for me. And he was very complimentary and very, um, you know, he, he really helped me get me things going. It was difficult to build that chemistry because typically this job you do in person with people. When you stop being in person, all of the nonverbal cues go out the window. A lot of commentators will do things like point, they'll tap each other. You know, if I'm waffling, he can just go, oi, there's something really important happening, you idiots. You're talking about... The flowers. And he's right, because I like to do that. Because some of the art design in this game is really good. Um, but th that's all that stuff is gone. So having to relearn that very quickly, um, when we dived in halfway through MW and going at MW Champs and trying to put on the best show we possibly could for the biggest tournament we've seen for a really long time, was not an easy thing to do. So we had to really, we spent hours and hours and hours. And I mean, hours. We poured over VOD. We talked to each other. We tried to build that chemistry out of the game as much as possible and by chemistry more than anything because we're already mates it's the it's the communication it's knowing when i've stopped it's knowing when he's going to stop it's knowing when i think he wants to say something and once we develop that cadence and that rhythm 
if you listen to it now, there's a very particular way, maybe not so much in la on land because we can, we can feel it out more, but online there's a rhythm and it's almost like a song that we are sort of getting, uh, we've, we've got going, especially in hard points. Good question though. Really good question. I also reached out to some of your Discord stuff and oh, and the milestones. Yes, the milestones are great, but unfortunately, only one person responded, and that was Mr. Chaos Knight. Chaos the hero. Um, he asks, "What is the best piece of advice you received when you first started casting either Halo or Cut?" Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I have had, I suppose. I've had some really, uh, not necessarily any mentors, but I've, I've, I've reached out to some phenomenal people in the industry and outside of the industry um, who have given me really good advice. Dave Rosowski, who is a improv teacher um, who, who went to Second City with Steve Carell, like other brilliant, brilliant comedians. His, I was at a class of his and he taught me that no matter what, your, brain is a, your brain is a fucking liar. And it is trying to destroy you at all times. It is, it is trying to stop you from being great. And that is a complicated thing to unpack. So I'll do my best. But it's basically, uh, let, me, let me rephrase that because there's a lot to cover here. But your brain is a liar. It's trying to destroy you. Also that take what you do very, very seriously, but don't take yourself very seriously is another great piece of Rosowski-isms. Um, he was a really, really great teacher. Other, other good piece of advice I received was um, from a guy from ESPN, his name was Gus, who was a, an astonishing talent coach who really, really went deep with us. He said, if you're on broadcast, I want to see, of the many things he said, if you're on broadcast, I want to see five elements. I want, I want to see at least three elements as miles of personality. So I want you to give me five, and then at any time, show me three of them, which is a difficult thing to do, but um, that was also very, very helpful. Very, very helpful. And I suppose the last piece, I'm trying to think of any more good advice. I've received tons of good advice. I've written all of it down, but the ones that really, really stick with me yeah, uh, are probably those two, which is, I mean, honestly, trying to have fun more than anything. Carl, we can talk about this for hours if you'd like, sir, because there's a lot here to, to unpack. Let's turn it all back to yourself. Where do you see yourself in a year? Oh, God knows. No idea, mate. Probably, probably still cast in Vanguard. Um, from this exact moment, oh, I'll be whatever cod's next. Who knows? MW two, whatever. I don't know. The rumors, it's the rumors. I think I would like to stay with Call of Duty for as long as I possibly can, until sort of cod's done with me. Um, I like it here. I like the fans. I like the game. I like the people I work with. I love Chance. Really love Chance. You know, he's he's great, and I hope he never sees this. Um, but he's definitely the best partner. I've ever had ever could dream of as long as he picks up his phone and wakes up at normal times of the day so that we can work and do stuff that's absolutely fine but yeah man i mean that i, th I think that's where i see myself in a year's time um truthfully in this industry you never know so keep doors open and uh and seeing what happens definitely i'm gonna be my cheeky little self please and if you had to break up a caster duo and steal a partner who would it be Oh, good question. I've always wanted to work with Merc. I love Joe. I think he's got he's got the most brilliant brain um, for Call of Duty, and he's just wonderful. He's got a, he's, he's he really does see things well. Um, who else would I love to work with? I thought a study. I think Jay's got an amazing energy, man. Jay is the funniest man in the green room, bar none. No one makes us laugh more than study, and you guys don't always get to see that on broadcast. But you know, he's quite new here, so he's learning, he's getting around it, and he's more and more study is coming out, which is so good. Because anyone's ever watched study streams, and I saw a Reddit thread about this recently, like he is fucking hilarious. He's got the most unbelievable energy, and again, another person who knows the game inside out. So you've got this perfect combination of wicked humor, like a, a, a singular personality that is completely you cannot imitate Jay and game knowledge he is a brilliant brilliant partner um from any other game though oh shit i love henry g very very dearly obviously he doesn't commentate anymore now but from the counter-strike scene um he was a really good friend of mine for a long time i mean like i loved him very very dearly and i think he'd be an amazing partner to work with because he's just got his unbridled work ethic and he really knows his shit whatever the game may be I'd, I'd make the sacrifice for that um but there's a lot of people out there in esports who i would really love to work with but making it happen is the hard bit really 
What's one game that you've never really jumped into that you thought you may? Would it be Gears, maybe FIFA, Overwatch, Valorant? Who knows? Oh, I've actually done almost all of those. I've worked almost all those games. Overwatch, casting Overwatch made me a much better commentator because it's a really difficult game to commentate. And um, I think if anything now, the only game I haven't really worked on, modern game that I've not really worked on, Valorant. I think Valorant would be really cool. I think it's a good game. I think it's got a great program behind it. Riot know what they're doing. Um, and it's a really sort of, it's a strange pace compared to what we used to in Call of Duty, but I think that'd be a really good thing to learn. And, and if I ever get the opportunity, uh, I don't think I ever will get the opportunity now, but um, if I ever did, yeah, I think Valorant would probably be the one. But for any, again, this is another good piece of advice for any aspiring casters, diversify as much as you possibly can. Not only um, is it good to, you know, just increase your, your sort of chances of getting work, but also it's a really great way to level up your skills fast. So learn, learn everything always this call of duty roster dynasty i mean it says top left as well but dynasty for sure screenplay love this man right here goat the emotion pouring through you pride the merger <laughs> it's the opposite of a surprise inevitable maybe chances to go though no, these do be the facts <laughs> Taylor, thank you, mate. This was a real joy. Thank you very much.